It's June 21st, the traditional beginning of summer and the shortest night of the year. And right now, there are only 5.5 hours of nautical to astronomical dark. And it's on this night that I've decided to begin shooting this very dim target here, LDN1235, otherwise known as the Dark Shark Nebula. It's such a dim target that I'm pretty sure I'm going to need at least 20 hours of integration on it. And when you think about it, this is really the wrong time of the year to begin imaging such a target, since it is so dim and will require so much integration time. It's going to take multiple nights, and there is no way around that. If this was during the winter, where I could get a dozen hours of good darkness during the night, it would be about two nights worth of imaging. As it is right now, it'll be four to five nights worth of imaging. And because this target is so dim, I'm only going to image this on nights of a half moon or less. But I'm beginning the imaging now because presently it's well positioned. But given how short the nights are right now, it has me thinking a lot about making my sequencer more efficient. If you're unfamiliar with sequencing, it refers to the steps or the process by which an astrophotography rig goes through in order to shoot an image. It's not as easy as just point and shoot. Plate softening has to happen so that the mounting software can turn the telescope toward the target very precisely within arc seconds. Guiding must go on through the night, and even then occasionally there'll be some drift, so every now and then, the image has to be plate soft again and then recentered. As temperature changes, so will focus, and whenever an image is captured, there is the time required to write the image to disk, and also dithering must occur. Dithering is a process of introducing random slight changes of only a few pixels into the positioning of the camera, which helps the stacking software distinguish what is signal versus what is noise. Each one of these processes eats up time, and all of them together can eat up a significant amount of time, to the point that in an hour of shooting, I actually capture 46 minutes worth of integration. During long winter nights, I might not worry so much about this because it would only take me about two nights to capture 20 hours worth of integration. But during these exceedingly short summer nights, I want to make use of every possible minute for integration. So the question is, can I make my sequence more efficient? Let's begin looking at writing time, or the time that it takes for the mini PC in the observatory to write an image to its internal SSD. I've measured that carefully, and it takes 2.25 seconds. I shoot 60 second subs, so were I able to get 60 subs per hour or 60 minutes worth of integration, that would create 135 seconds of disk write time. This is an inefficiency. I could reduce it by shooting longer subs. For example, if I shot 5 minute subs, those subs would have the same amount of memory and require about 2 seconds to write to the SSD, but they would only have to be written 12 times per hour rather than 60, reducing write time to just 27 seconds. I know by the way that I'm adding this time to the hour, I'm just keeping the math simple here. However, while at first glance, shooting longer exposures for each sub might seem the simplest solution, shooting longer subs creates a new host of compromises and problems. Longer subs are more apt to reveal any slight flaws in tracking. I live on a mountaintop where the wind is apt to buffet the telescope during the night, introducing vibrations, and longer subs would be more likely to suffer from that. Longer subs are also more likely to capture unwanted airplane trails or satellite trails tracing across them and longer subs will be far more inclined to show any problems introduced by the atmosphere. So as far as I'm concerned, shooting longer subs would create more problems than I feel the compromise is worth. The next thing to look at is dithering. Dithering is absolutely essential. And a good rule of thumb that I've seen float around the Cloudy Nights website that I often frequent is that one should dither every five to six minutes. However, I found that doesn't hold true. Through experimentation, I have found that it's more about the percentage of subs that you dither. Like, in the old days, when I used to shoot 300 second or 5 minute subs, I dithered one in every three subs, which is once every 15 minutes. And those images came out fine, indicating to me that it's not about over how many minutes that you dither, but rather the percentage by which you dither. And what I've found is a 15 to 30% dither ratio works quite well. Now, this may not apply if one is shooting even longer subs, 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute subs. A few people do that if they have very high end mounts. It's not personally a strategy that I would take even if I had an extremely high-end mount due to the other problems that it creates, but maybe dithering ratios would work differently with such extremely long exposures. But I find with exposure times of 300 seconds or less that 15 to 30% dithering ratio works quite well. So, since I shoot 60 second subs, I dither every fifth exposure, or 20%. And that has worked extremely well in terms of noise management. 
I don't think I can reduce that anymore though, without compromising on the quality of the images. And honestly, the way I look at astrophotography, I look at it like making wine. Patience is a virtue. So I'd rather take longer to shoot extremely high quality images than rush them and get low quality images faster. So I'm going to stick with my 20% dithering ratio and dither my 60 second subs once every fifth exposure. Another way I can look at increasing the total integration time I have is to change filters less often. When the filter wheel moves, even if it's just going over to the next filter on the wheel, it eats up a few seconds. Over the course of an hour, that's not much. For example, during the RGB portion of my sequence, when the filter wheel is changing every 20 minutes, the filter changes would eat up a total of 15 seconds, and then another 5 seconds when it switches over to the luminance, which it'll maintain for an hour. That's 20 seconds every 2 hours. If I reduce that, then I can shave off a few seconds from my sequencer. It doesn't sound like much, in fact it hardly sounds that it's worth it, but any time that I can shave off of inefficiencies is cumulative. So, one change that I've made is I've decided to change filters less often. So, one of the new sequencing strategies that I've decided upon is to shoot my R, G, and B first thing, get them out the way, and then shoot on luminance for the rest of the night. During the short summer nights, I'll shoot 30 minutes each of R, G, and B losing 17.5 seconds per two hour period to filter wheel changes. Shooting begins at nautical dusk always with the red filter, the reason being, if there is any lingering trace of light in the air at nautical dusk, and at nautical dusk, if there's a very slight bit, red is less sensitive to that. And by the time the red filter is finished shooting and we move into the green and the blue, which are a bit more sensitive to lingering light, it's completely dark. Now, whenever the filter changes, focus needs to be adjusted. I could speed along the autofocus process by using offsets. In other words, base the focus of the green and the blue filters on an offset pre-measured from the red filter. But in my circumstances, that would be a mistake. I live on top of a mountain. It's not very high, but high enough that temperature changes rapidly just after dusk. And temperature changes lead to focus changes. So I'm better off doing several focus checks over the course of the first 90 minutes after dusk. Therefore, I'll run a full focus check each 30 minutes as the system switches from red to green to blue filters. However, autofocusing L, R, G, and B filters is fairly quick, especially when compared to narrow band. An entire focus sequence takes 2 minutes and 21.5 seconds on my system, and it's the same whether I'm shooting on luminance or the R, G, and B filters. After the RGB sequence, I'll switch over to the luminance filter for the rest of the night and run focus checks every 60 subs which, in tangible terms, will work out to about once every 75 minutes. Using this new system, over the first two hours, I end up autofocusing as much as I did in the old system, but after the first two hours, technically after the first 90 minutes, I will end up conducting one focus check per 75 minute period, gaining a little over two minutes and 30 seconds per hour. And when you add in the time gain by changing the filter wheel less often, that's an average of five extra subs per two hour period. Now, Granted, that doesn't seem like much, does it? Not even to me. It's only five minutes of additional integration, five more subs. Nonetheless, especially on these very short nights, that helps. However, the new strategy takes advantage of a characteristic of luminance versus RGB filters that adds tremendously to the efficiency gain. You see, shooting in luminance is 300% more efficient than shooting in RG and B. That is to say, one hour of luminance integration is worth three hours of R, G, and B integration. A concept I demonstrated in my previous video on the fallacy of creating synthetic luminance images for editing. And the reality is, it's fairly quick to capture color information. What takes a long time to capture is light and shadow, which is a form of low frequency information, and especially detail, a form of high frequency information. In my old sequence, I was aiming for a one-to-one -one ratio of luminance to R, G, and B. So, if you think of luminance as three times more efficient than shooting in R, G, and B, and look at the ratio of luminance to R, G, and B being shot in that old sequence, I was shooting in luminance for one hour, and R, G, and B for one hour, giving each color filter 20 minutes exposure. That makes for 60 minutes luminance and 60 minutes R, G, B for a one-to-one -one ratio. But if we assign a point value based on efficiency, one luminance hour is worth three points, and one R, G, and B hour is worth one point for a total of four points. But in the new sequence, I'm going to spend considerably less time capturing color information. It just doesn't take as long. This image here, for example, of the Witch's Broom Nebula was shot using the new ratio, and only 30% of its information was color. 
So in the new sequence, I'm going to aim for a 3 to 1 ratio of luminance to RG and B, or 75% luminance. If successful, this means that 3 hours of luminance will be shot for every hour of RG and B, and if we apply our point system to that as before, since luminance filters are 3 times more efficient than RG and B filters, 3 hours of shooting in luminance is worth 9 points, while the 1 hour of RGB is still worth 1 point for a total of 10 points. That's 10 points of efficiency compared to the old system at 4 points. Therefore, this new imaging sequence should be 2.5 times more efficient than the previous imaging sequence. And that is a 250% efficiency gain. That's very significant, and it's an efficiency which can only be obtained by shooting an LRGB. The Dark Shark will make a great test for this new sequence. Like many dark nebulae, it doesn't have much color. If the new sequence, using only 25% RGB, can pull good color out of the Dark Shark, then this new sequence will allow me to make significantly better use of integration time, summer and winter. And it may indicate latitude for shooting even less RGB. It is much quicker to capture color information than light, shadow, and fine detail. And that provides the greatest opportunities for efficiency gains. So, experimentation will indicate whether or not this is going to work, and by how much. And I'll let you know how it goes. And in the meantime, if you shoot RGB, you may want to try shaking up your luminance to RGB ratios for yourself, and see what kind of results you can get. The great power of LRGB is its ability to be more efficient, and clear, dark nights are rare enough, so why not get the most out of them? Thanks for watching, and if you have any thoughts or observations, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Now, get out there and shoot that incredible sky.